need to be holy in every way, every way. So in other words, no matter what we're experiencing, God's peace is to help and to guide and to empower us every way. He says how you can tell us how character is that we are brought up into three qualities, being your body, soul, and spirit. It is a beautiful three-part being of who we are, we can let us. In other words, that it still follows the unity to what God is trying to put all these accomplish through us. And the word that we're trying to is because sometimes we walk off away from the promises of God trying, because sometimes we don't believe the promises of God trying. Sometimes we walk too much of things that we need to impact our behavior and impact our belief system and impact our conversations. So when he's speaking about that this that God can continue to be developing us in this body, soul, and spirit, I felt that God wanted us to talk about this tonight, that we would express the matter of what God is trying to do in our life or in our circumstances as we would cite God's name. The body, soul, and spirit is body is the physical part, soul is the psychological part, and spirit is the spiritual part. It's our connection that is with God. So body, to define that, gives us the matter of the five senses that we're to experience. Uh, the hearing, the seeing, the physical touch, uh, you know, the five senses of which we have. These are the things that connect to the tangible, the visible, and the material world. And this is how, when you're engaged with this, there is something that we have limitations, and that's all we see, that's all we know, that's all we experience. We're, we're limited to what God is trying to show us. And so, parallel this, the matter of Judges 6.15, what God is talking to Gideon, and Gideon has the matter of the physical senses of knowing who he is, where he's at in life, and he sees it as a limitation. Now, if you really quick history, is that Gideon, I mean, all of, his, all of Israel is impacted by these outsiders that are destroying and robbing of their crops, their income, their resources, and for them to find a new ability to keep what they have grown and developed to survive, Gideon gives us a good picture of what is taking place in that culture. He is hiding in the well, and he's hiding and trying to protect the resources of which he has. And this is the picture of what society has created and he is now becoming. He is hiding to these physical things that he is trying to keep, but he is afraid of losing. And then the angel of the Lord appears to him and he means that is quality, almighty oh, and abounding. In other words, you're mighty because of God. You are built and are purposed for victory as a mighty warrior. But the matter of his physical and what is being spoken to him in his spirit is a disconnect. He goes to say this and he applies this to hope.
hearing or what we're seeing. So it takes to the next part. I would give to you the example of 1 Kings 19. This is Elijah right after Mount Carmel. After the 450 prophets have been slain and he is now victorious where the power of God had come down and consumed the altar. All the water had been licked up by the fire and the power of God and he was declared to be sovereign and supreme. And then he gets this note that's from Jezebel and she says in this note, this letter, the same thing that you did to these prophets are the same thing I'm going to do to you. Now prior to this, you also need to know, Elijah has been running for his life because Jezebel and Ahab had been chasing and killing the prophets all over the place. And so he is now feeling outcast and he's feeling limited. And what he's probably experiencing is that he thought this would be the end and no longer do we have to worry about this because God proved himself sovereign. But what he realizes is nothing had changed and emotionally he's worn out. Emotionally he's fatigued. Emotionally he is now wrestling, I believe, with I, I just don't see the point of it anymore. And so he is to this point where he says, I've had enough. I don't know if you've ever said that. I always use the joke of Popeye. I've had all I can stands, I can't stands no more. And our spinach would be the word of God. Can I get an amen to that? It would be... We would draw to that, but I hear a lot of times people say, I can't handle this anymore. I can't. You're on my last nerve. I mean, we have these idioms and statements that says, this is the end of it. But God is trying to say to us, we understand what you're going through. You're not the first one. And Elijah felt like you felt maybe at times or too many times. And he says, take my life for I am. And notice this. It's almost like throwing a towel in. I am no better than my parents. I'm no better than my forefathers. I'm no better than those who've gone before me. If we do the study, I think we would say, he's a major prophet doing major miracles. But his impression of himself, or the ideal of himself, is that he's not enough. He's probably looking at the information and probably saying, look, I did this and it still didn't make a change. It's obviously not God, it's probably me. And then he just wants to quit. I'm tired of running, I'm tired of the race, I'm tired of the challenges, I'm tired of being cooped up, I'm tired of this COVID virus, I'm tired of the news, I'm tired of the bad news, I'm tired of life. Can Jesus come even so quickly like Lord Jesus right now? Now, you might have said that. You might have said, Lord, I'm ready to check out. But if God hasn't taken us yet, then he's saying don't check out. He is telling us to check in to check in that we are the lights, that check in that we are the difference makers, to check in that we are the influencers. And so I would encourage you that if we're still here, we're not sitting on the sidelines. He wants us to get engaged. Can I get an amen to that? That we're a part of the healing, part of the unity, part of the blessing, part of the encouragement that the world needs to hear. I'm drawn back to that quiz that said, are you doing a six or a five or a four or a three or two or one? And all of us wrote, now there was no one at one, nobody at two, nobody at three in our group. So praise God for that. So four, five, and six is looking really good. If you're at four, let's get to five, amen? And if you're at five, let's get to six. And if you're at six, keep pulling people up to say, get up here because this is what God can do through us. This is what we want to champion to be the light, the influence to our community. Well, going back to this guy, Elijah, he's struggling. But when we look at this, Here's how we need to be encouraged. As we face battles, this is the promise of God for Joshua, just like it's a promise for us. Don't be afraid or don't be discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you. The Lord your God. The Lord your God. The Lord your God is with you. You're not alone. You're not separated. You're not forgotten. He is encouraging your spirit. He's encouraging your mind. He's encouraging your heart to realize that you are not alone and not to become defeated emotionally, not to be believing the negative of the mind, but to start championing the belief that the will that God wants you to choose is not on how you feel or not what you see, but rather than what you believe that God is with you and He can change the atmosphere. He can change the environment. He can change a system. He can change a government. He can change us. And if he can change us, he can change anything. Because all we are is a conglomerate of people that are filled with an opportunity to make a change. Your voice matters. Your belief matters. 
Your heart matters. Every person needs to know the voice of God and we are those voices that represent God. We need to hear that love. We need to hear that joy. We need to hear that peace that comes from the promises and the assurances of God. That's why Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 15, but thank God He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us victory. I think that's something we would really love to hear that God has said for you. What you're facing is going to head towards victory because God is setting you up for a blessing. Do you want victory in your life? Do you want victory after another victory in your life? Then it's up to us to trust that what God is trying for us to champion, to build in this faith, is to give us peace through the matter of not only the physical of the body, but now the emotion of the spirit of who we are. Do we believe it? Do we adhere to it? Do we teach it, preach it? Do we continue to witness it everywhere we go? This is the victory that God has for us. Then, the third and the last is the Spirit of God. It's the spiritual realm. It's where we contact, it's where we receive, it's where we connect, and it's where we fellowship with God. It's what makes us different than any other animal, <clears throat> is that we have the Spirit of God. But we have the Spirit of God because we were once dead, but then Jesus made us alive. Alive in the Spirit that we then can read the Word and comprehend it and understand it. We can see the light and understand what God is doing. It's something that God does that when we've been made alive spiritually, we can discern and we can understand the Word of God. That's why we need to make contact with God so that we can receive and then we can connect so that we can continue fellowshipping with God as we do this in the Spirit. Romans tells us that our spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit that we are the children of God, that we're part of the family. And so it's our connection that we have with that. Now, the, the third part I would probably use as an example that I think is where Jacob is wrestling. He's wrestling with God. To be more accurate, we would call that he's wrestling actually with Jesus Christ. Because John 4.24 says God is a spirit, and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we know if this is an accurate event that's taking place, then this is not Jacob wrestling God. This is Jacob wrestling Jesus Christ. This is what we call as a theophany. It's a pre-manifestation of Jesus Christ. And as this is the wrestling match that goes on, the interesting subject is why I pointed this out in here, is that God asks this question when Jacob says, I won't let you go and let you bless me. And then Jesus says, who are you? Or what is your name? Now that makes no sense when you read that because you're saying, wait a minute, isn't God omniscient? Isn't he all-knowing? Why would he be asking this question? Because it doesn't fit the character of knowing who God is. Is he just playing games or is there an actual reason to it? And I think there is a reason that seems to make sense to me. See if it does to you. You see, Jacob means the word deceiver. And Jacob had pretended at one point to be like his brother Esau. He put on the disguise. He put on the act that he was somebody else. And he did that for deception to be able to get the blessing, the blessing that was to the firstborn, the blessing of the birthright. And he, he did all of this in that deception, and here's where God is now, I think, asking him this question. So you're so busy playing someone else, who are you? You're playing games all the time, but you're not being your real self, so who are you pretending to be today? Jacob, who are you? And I think that's the question that God even asks us. Who are you? Who are you in the matter of how you are navigating these decisions? How you are navigating how you connect and how you transpire a, an effort to make a change and how you confront areas in life? Who are you trying to become? And I think as Christians, we want to be the same person. And this is where God begins to change this because he makes this, says, uh, makes this statement in the next verse he says, your name will no longer be Jacob. In other words, no longer are you going to be called deceiver. No longer are you going to be the one who, you know, tries to snatch away something from somebody else. That's not going to be your identity anymore. Your identity is going to be changed because from now on, you're going to be called Israel. Uh, Israel means one that can, uh, fights with God or one that triumphs with God. 
Notice the name of the change that God gives a change towards Jacob. You're no longer the past. You're now going to be this in the future. Well, that, that uh, connects with us. Paul tells us that we are no longer the old nature. There is a new nature that comes within us. That new nature is to give us peace, that we are connected with God, with his Holy Spirit, that we're no longer limited by these things that we are uh, you know, you have to play the game. You have to play the part. You have to play the system. You've got to run the way that the world is telling you that it's ran. Now, it's something that God is saying, I want you to recognize that you are one that triumphs with God. You're the one that contends with God. You're the one that wrestles with God so that you will see an outcome that's different. And this is where God says, I'm going to change your name because your name is to be changed the way we're supposed to be, no longer our old nature. What was our old nature? Were we liars? What was our old natures? Connivers? Deceivers? What was our old nature? Selfish? What was our old nature? Pick it in the matter of what it may have been, but as Christ's followers, we have been given a new creation, a new creature, a new chance, a new start with a newness that he has given to us, that we are now to find that peace that comes from God that comes that as we're connected with God, we're connected to His mind shaping us and our hearts being shaped by Him. And then our body, our actions are flowing out to make an impact into this world so that body, soul, and spirit are in unity for what God has developed in our lives that we are then faithfully doing. That's why Ephesians 1 says God decided in advance to make us part of the family, to adapt, adopt us into His own and bringing us himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave God, it gave him great pleasure to make us a part of his family. It's what he's always wanted to do. So we bring that to it. the next verse. So, so we praise God for his glorious grace that he's poured out into us. He is rich in kindness and grace, and that he's purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and has forgiven us from sins. And then the last verse, it says he showered us with kindness on us, and then with all wisdom and with understanding. Notice that he, he showered us with all wisdom and understanding so that we can live in peace, that we could have the peace that he gives to us. So the body, the soul, and the spirit, it's what he connects with us in all of this that we would understand what uh, Paul says in Romans. He says there's nothing that can separate us. Nothing can separate us from what God has started to do and completing to do, completing to going to be done in our lives. Nothing from death or life. So he starts with the physical, talks with the body part. Don't worry about death. Don't worry about death because death is not the end. It's not the final part. It's not just this life. Don't let life make your decisions. It's a life that is yet to come. Live for eternity, so let the tangible and the minds of what you're talking about first be understood that nothing's going to separate you from God, neither angels or demons. Now he jumps over to the matter of the spiritual realm, saying no matter if you now see what's happening in, or you don't see what's happening in the spiritual realm, but you believe in that, don't worry about the principalities and powers because they don't have sovereign authority because you know that with God and prayer and his will and you in obedience, this is where he wants to build peace into your life. He says, neither fears for today or worries for tomorrow. Then so he, now he goes to the emotional part. You know, the matter of how we interpret things, how we feel about things. Don't let those things regulate your day or manage your day or tell you what it's going to be. Then he says that even the powers of hell can separate us. And then he goes again to the spiritual realm of saying, even the strength of hell itself cannot combat or overcome a believer in Jesus Christ. He's wanting to build a peace that's within us that's body, soul, and spirit. And then verse 39 says, No power in the sky above or in the earth below. No matter what you can see, as far as you can see or what you can experience here on this earth, nothing is going to be able to sabotage what God has in store for you, for me, for all of us. Then he concludes with saying, Nothing in all creation. Nothing. Of what you see that's there. Nothing. Nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. All of this statement is built with this principle to pour you into a thought of peace. 
that you can have peace at any time and any circumstance. In fact, I would say that if you're on a, an airplane and uh, you hear an engine seemingly decrease its power and you know it's not time for the plane to let the, uh, the uh, I was going to try to remember all my flight school ailerons and all of the things to be deployed to slow the plane for its landing and you knew that wasn't the case because we're too high, too far, too soon. And then all of a sudden the captain comes on and the captain begins by crying. Dear people, <laughs> you know, that, that's the matter of if the panic is in the pilot, I think we would all lose our faith, right? I think we would all be worried. In fact, I think we would all begin praying. Dear Jesus, I'm coming to see you real soon. But if the pilot comes on and has a calm voice and says, well, we've lost, uh, lost an engine, folks, but it's okay. We've got a plan of action. We're not too far. We've got it all under control. It gives us a different feeling. It gives us a different thought. It gives us a different behavior. That though you're being exposed to information that could be tragic and it could be difficult, because of the calmness of the pilot, it brings a calmness to us. That, that's what the Word of God does. The Word of God is the patience of that pilot, meaning God, speaking to our lives that says, Oh, I know you see a lot of things going on. I think you even see some other planes going down. I think you see and you experience what you are in the tangible. And then it's wanting to grip you with fear and it's wanting to take control of your emotions. But God is saying, look, I want to give you peace. So he pours that through his word that says, now why don't you stay in connection with me? Because that's the spirit. That's the pilot who gets through the uh, a conversation on the uh, radio waves or on the microphone and begins to speak this calmness that brings calmness to us because that's the promises that God gives. So this is how God builds us in body, soul, and spirit. That we would be filled with his body, that we are his containers in the sense that we make contact, that his Holy Spirit is poured into us. The Bible tells us that we are these treasures of clay and that, uh, excuse me, we are these jars of clay and in that he pours his treasures that's in us. So we're part of that. Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? We are these containers that we can contain the very power of God, the very presence of God, the very love of God being into our tangible lives. But then it's to the emotional part that God wants to give us his perfect peace that's through his Holy Spirit. The love of God, the peace of God, the joy of God, all of that is to pour into your being that you can have a perspective that is uniquely different 